A warm welcome to everybody and thank you for logging on to this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Stat Sports for the opportunity to present today. And I'm conscious that uh, maybe we have a lot of people on this webinar from all over the world. So a warm welcome to you. And I'd like to maybe just spend a couple of minutes introducing you to the game of hurling. So hurling is a stick and ball sport played by players who are, who are amateur. The stick, which is called a hurley, is made of ash timber and players select their own size. The ball is wrapped in leather and it is a little bit bigger than a tennis ball. And this ball can travel uh, any, anything up to 150 kilometers an hour, making it a really fast and dynamic game. The, the playing area is 145 meters by 90, which is approximately 40% larger than a football soccer pitch. There's 15 players on each team with five substitutes permitted at any stage. And the playing duration is 70 minutes in total, separated by two periods of 35 minutes each. So the aim of the game is to outscore the opposition. And you can do that by striking it through a goalpost. Now, the goalposts have a crossbar like in rugby, uh, but the crossbar is not as high. A goal is scored by striking the ball between the posts and under the, under the crossbar for three points and over the crossbar for a point. On average, there's 35 shots at each goal for each team. And on average, there's maybe two goals and 25 points for each team. So it's a highly entertaining game as there's a score approximately every 90 seconds. So there are 15 players on each team, 14 outfield players with one goalkeeper. And positions are organized into lines. So we have the full back line, half back line, two midfielders, half forward line and full forward line. And in each positional line, there's a convention of maybe player to player marking where the attacker's role is uh, to invade the defense and to, to score, where the defenders try and deny these scoring opportunities. Each role differs between the positions and usually the, the full back line uh, attempt to stay close to the goal to minimize goal scoring opportunities. The half back line in defense move back towards the full back line to deny the space. And uh, when they're attacking, they can move anything up to midfield, uh, but they tend to stay between that area. Midfielders then act as a link between attack and defense. They tend to move where the ball is located. The half forward line role is to gain possession of the ball, to score or to create space for the full forward line. And then the full forward line usually stay close to the goals. However, they are not limited to do, do so. Uh, some may move out, to, out the field to create space for the other two players inside or maybe leaving one player inside uh, to expose the defense. Now, scores can be attempted from 70 to 80 meters away from the goals. So chasing your opponents and getting away from your opponents is a key element to the game. So I'd like now to show you a short piece of video and hopefully it will play. It's about 40 seconds long and we'll, um, hopefully it will play for you. So hopefully that came through okay for you. But a couple of aspects maybe of the game I hope you're to, uh, to, uh, able to observe. 
that hurling can be described as a random, chaotic, invasion type game. The technical skills of the game require a high level of, of co coordination. The ball can travel large distances from one end of the field to the other very, very quickly. The players can be engaged in the activity quite suddenly. Players need to display high levels of concentration throughout the game. The game of hurling is unique in that players represent the place in which they were born. There's no transfer market in hurling. And this is one of the, the reasons why the game is so popular. The fact that players get to represent where they are born against other players where they, where they are born. So com teams compete for provincial and an All-Ireland Hurling Championships. Now, here we see Crow Park and All-Ireland Final Day. There's large attendances and the game are, are very, very popular. But these players are amateur. Amateur in the fact that they don't get any payment for playing. And all players hold maybe full-time jobs. Now, however, these players can be training up to six times per week, engaging in three to four field sessions and two gym sessions. Now, in the last few years, strength and conditioning coaches have become popular within the sport, with each team now having maybe one to two coaches working with their teams. Now, over the years, numerous training approaches have been applied. In fact, a lot of copying of training methods have taken place. And some of these methods maybe have uh, been questionable. A tendency of the All-Ireland champions, whatever training they do, is then replicated across other counties. However, during this time, there was a serious lack of knowledge about the match play demands of hurling. In fact, uh, before my PhD research, only one published paper was available that described the match play demands. Now, when we think about the game, the conditioning of players should rely on the evidence-based research that quantifies the match play demands of hurling. With players really restricted from a time point of view, having to balance work and training, we need to maximize the time that we spend with those players. So if we don't know what happens in the game, we cannot be specific in the preparation of these players to meet those um, demands of the game. So today, I want to share with you some of those demands that we now know about the game of hurling. So the first set of results come from a study that investigated the match play, temporal, and position-specific physical and physiological demands of senior hurlers. There are 18 games used in this study, uh, including National Hurling League and championship matches. The variables that were investigated include the total distance, which is the volume of, of the over the game, the relative distance, so the distance covered every minute, the distance covered across five different speed zones, the peak speed, the, the total numbers of sprints, and the mean length of sprint. Now here we see a typical activity graph for, from a player's first half. We see that the time along the bottom and the speed of movement in meters per second along the, across the side. So every line that is going up is an increase in speed, and every line that is going down is a decrease in speed. So to quantify this distance covered at each speed, we use five different speed zones. And we're walking, jogging, running, high speed running and sprinting. Now, I do realize that high speed running and sprinting uh, thresholds are slightly lower than used in other sports, <clears throat> but we were bound by uh, previous research uh, when we were performing this study. So anything over 4.8 meters per second up to 6.1 we call high speed running and sprinting was over 6.1 meters per second. So the results. In a 70 minute game, hurlers covered on average a total distance of 7,800 meters. Now this is slightly lower than in Gaelic football and in soccer, but slightly higher than in rugby. Now averaged out over the 70 minutes, the relative distance was 109 meters every minute. And players reached a maximum speed on average of 8.4 meters per second. 
Now, it is important for us as coaches really to dig into the total figures because these are figures that are uh, accumulated from multiple distances. So here we see the total distance is broken down into five different speeds of movement, walking, jogging, running, high speed running and sprinting. We notice that there's a drop off in the distance covered as the speed increases. Now this is common right across team sports where the lowest distance is covered at the highest speed zone. Now we must take note that this distance is accumulated from many different entries into the different speed zones. And it is not for any particular length of time. Take for instance, what we see covered in the red box. And this, if we were to um, add all this together, it accumulates for the total distance walking which we see on the top um, graph over 3000 meters. So this walking distance is accumulated over time and not for any uh, length of periods together. So therefore, looking at this, conditioning for hurdlers should include players changing speeds frequently and players moving in and out of the walking zone uh, frequently. Now the distance covered Sprinting is also a total figure. And we see that over the 70 minutes, players covered on average 415 meters. Now this is made up on average of 22 sprints over a mean uh, length of 19 meters. The average peak speed recorded was 8.4 meters per second. Now remember that peak speed may have only occurred once in a game. So if we look at positions and we see that the total distance, high speed running and sprint distance was broken into the five positional lines that we've identified earlier. Now we see in the left hand column that the total, range, total distance ranges from the full forward line, 6,770, up to the highest distance covered on average was 8,679 midfielders. So the total distance differs between positions with the middle three positions, half backs, midfielders, and half forwards, highlighted in blue, covering more distance than the full back line and full forward line. Now this kind of makes sense if we, when we're looking at the game because these middle three positions tend to move up and down the field, whereas the full forward line and full back line usually tend to stay closer to the goals the fullbacks to try and prevent goal scoring opportunities and mark the full forwards and the full forwards uh, who try to score. Now, if we look at the center column and we see that a similar trend occurs for high speed running with the middle three positions outperforming the full back line and full forward line. <clears throat> However, as the intensity increases to sprinting, there are no differences across positions. Now, this is also evident in the numbers of sprints. So the value of sprinting is evident right across all positions, where players must sprint for the ball to attempt to gain possession, maybe before their opponent, or to chase their opponent for possession. Now, it is also important to remember that these are total figures that are accumulated from many entries in and out of each of the speed zones. So remember that the game is divided into two 35-minute um, halves, separated by a 15-minute break. And here we see a drop-off between halves. In total distance, there was a, a 91 meters less distance covered in the second half, 47 meters of high-speed running, and 16 meters less of sprint distance. There was also one less sprint in the second half and the peak speeds were, were similar. So looking at this, hurlers need to be conditioned to repeat similar running demands in each half. So what do we know so far? Well, players cover on average 7,800 meters, which is broken down into different speed zones. The distance covered reduces as the speed increases. The total sprint distance was 415 meters, 
which is broken down into an average of 22 sprints. So for our notes, for our training sessions, what we need to have players perform at least 22 sprints in training. Reach peak speeds of 8.4 meters per second. Perform extra total distance and high speed running for the middle three positions. But everyone can perform sprint training together. Between halves, there was a minimal drop off between halves in total distance, high speed running, and, and second half, uh, sorry, sprint distance in the second half. Now, it's been proposed that only a focus on to the total sprint distance does not provide sufficient information about the high intensity demands of, of hurling because of the intermittent nature of match play. Now, from our observation of the high intensity efforts, a lot of them happen um, close to the ball and close to the action. So therefore, I wanted to further describe the sprint demands of elite hurling. So as coaches, we usually plan and implement speed drills by marking out distances for players to sprint to and from. So therefore, to help design specific drills, we use the information in this study to separate uh, sprints into uh, the number of sprints under 20 meters and over 20 meters. Now we see that hurling is a dynamic intermittent game where players reach maximum speeds on average of 8.4 meters per second. But how many times do they sprint up near their peak speed? Because if they do, these sprints are more demanding. Now, in this study, each player's peak speed was tested over a 40 meter trial to work out their peak speed. And then we classify their sprints within games into three categories. So we counted the number of sprints from 6.1 meters per second up to 80%, 80 to 90% of their peak speed and above 90% uh, of their peak speed. We also want to look at the duration between sprints to find out how frequent they are over a game. And also the number of repeated sprints. So that is how many times the two sprints occur within 60 seconds. Now remember that a sprint only occurs when the players are traveling over that 6.1 meters per second. They may be getting up there, but they're not getting credit for it until they go over that threshold. And they must hold it for one second. So what you need to do and to figure out is how long does it take your players to get up to this sprint threshold? So the ball moves between different locations quite quickly. So maybe players don't have the opportunity to get up to this sprint threshold. So here we see one player uh, activity graph for a full game. Now this player is a midfield player. We can see the first half, uh, the separation in the middle for the half time, and then the second half. In blue, we see the player's activity and the sprints are highlighted in purple lines. Now for, for this study, we only concentrated on the sprints. That is the run that reached the sprint threshold and was maintained for one second. Now using the stats board export for sprints, I was able to classify the sprints by their distance and the time a sprint started and finished. So this gave us an opportunity to look at the sprint duration and also the duration between sprints. The peak speed of each sprint was identified and then placed into one of the three sprint categories, intensity categories. So what did we find? Well, there was a total of 22 sprints in the game, and the majority of sprints are under the 20 meters, with 14, and eight over 20 meters. So when setting up sprinting activities for hurling, we should include mainly sprint practices for under 20 meters, but also we need to include sprints lasting over the 20 meters so that they're ready to perform in, when they got um, experience in, in the game. Now, what we found was the shortest distance of a sprint was seven meters up to the longest distance 
was 33 meters. Now remember that it's 20 meters after they hit the sprint entry. So if we're practicing sprints from a standing start, this will be actually longer than 20 meters. Now being specific to the sprint demands of hurling, players should be able to perform sprints of various lengths up to the 33 meters because players are required to decrease their speed after this. Now the average duration between sprints was 208 seconds. Now if we look at the graph underneath on the bottom of the slide, we can see that the players' sprints can be grouped together as we see in the first part of the, of the game. And then this can be spread out. And in the second half, they can be more evenly spread out in the first half. There was five, on average, five repeated sprints in a game. That is, five, on five occasions, there was two sprints within 60 seconds of each other. Now remember, we wanted to find out how many times the players reached their near peak speed in the game. So we divided each sprint that occurred into three sprint categories. Now we found that the majority of sprints happen between 6.1 meters per second and 80% of their peak speed. Eight sprints occur between 80 and 90% of their uh, speed. And on average, players sprint up near their peak speed three times in the game. So these results emphasize the real importance of the player's ability to perform sprints of varying speed during the match play. As they sprint maybe to support their teammates in possession, maybe to create space to receive a pass, or maybe to chase after opponents when they are in possession. Now we need to set up uh, sprint practices with distances long enough so that players can reach over that 90% of their peak speed, especially if they're starting their sprint from a standing start. Now the positions we separated like, like before into the five positional lines. Now the metrics analyzed include the numbers of sprints, the number of sprints under and over 20 meters, the peak speed, the number of sprints under 80%, between 80 and 90% and above 90%, the duration between sprints, and the number of repeated sprint bouts. And what was shown was that there was no difference across any of the positions for any of these six uh, metrics analysts. So when we're setting up sprint pra training practices for hurlers, all positions can train together. Now, if we're doing our inter, um, engaged in integrated conditioning, maybe with the skills coach or the position specific tactical coaching, or maybe even small sided games, we must ensure that all players are reaching the same amount of sprints. So here we see an example of sprints performed by three different positions over the full game. Now, all of these examples are from the same game. This shows us the direction of sprints. And we, what we see from the, the three images is that players experience sprints of various lengths from short to long. Now, remember back that they perform 14 sprints under the 20 meters and eight sprints over the 20 meters. Now, looking at the direction of their sprints, they're often involved in the curved run, maybe where players are trying to get away from their opponents or take on their, their opponent. Now, the location of the sprints tend to be where the positions are located on the field. The half back line and half forward line players on either side of the screen perform sprints going towards the goals and away from the goals in each half. The midfielder sprints are typically located around the middle of the field. But the majority of sprints in this occasion were heading towards the sideline. Now, remember that this is only a picture of the physical demands. So we must consider maybe the technical and tactical situations that are happening at the time. 
So they give purpose to perform the sprints. So integrating this sprint practice into skill activities and small set of games are really necessary so the players get used to deciding when to sprint. Now the majority of sprint efforts occur around the ball. So that using the ball in practice will help with this decision-making process. Now an interesting finding when we looked at the difference between playing halves across, across all the metrics, there was a minimal drop-off. We see that there was two less sprints in the total numbers of sprints. One under 20 meters and one on, uh, over 20 meters. One under 80 percent and one uh, between 80 and 90. The peak speed was similar across uh, both. And there were 16 more seconds between sprints on average in the second half. And there was one less repeated sprint bout in the second half. So hurlers need to be able to perform similar sprint demands in each half. Now, if we look at the sprints in the activity graph on the bottom of the screen, we can see that the sprints are at the start of the game, right up against halftime, following halftime, throughout the second half, and towards the end of the half. Now, I do acknowledge that we need to play sprints at the start of our training session so that players are fresh and we attempt to increase their peak speed. But players perform their sprints at the start, at the middle, and at the end of games as well. So there may need to be, able, uh, there may be a need to play sprints towards the middle and end of our training sessions so that players can perform them uh, when they're fatigued. So now, what do we know so far? We need to vary the length of sprints. We need to allow the space to reach uh, players reaching their above 90% of their peak speed. We need to perform different intensities of sprints. We need to include variations of directions of sprints. Now, repeated sprints are rare, but they do happen in the match. In terms of positions, the directions and the context of what they're sprinting are important. So players sprinting to, to and away from the, from the goals. And between halves, there's now also a minimal drop off in the numbers of sprints, the length of sprint, the number of repeated sprint bouts. Sprints happen um, in the middle and late in the game. So again, we may need to think about putting sprints practices or ensuring that they happen within our activities at the middle of our training session and at the end of the training sessions. So going back to the, the player's first half activity, and we concentrate on that 20 minute period between sprints in the first half. If we only focus on sprints, we might be missing out on other demanding activity. Now, if we assess this period for changes in speed at three meters per second, now, if we focus on the top of the graph, we see that there's nine accelerations, and these are indicated by the green lines. And we see that there's 10 decelerations marked by the orange lines. Now, I want you to look at the top of the graph, and I want you to look at the accelerations and decelerations. And take a moment, do you notice anything about it? We see that accelerations and decelerations are spread out over the 20 minutes. There is intense activity happening between those sprints at either end of the, the screen. Did you notice that some accelerations and decelerations are standalone? while other accelerations are far followed directly after a deceleration. So players perform quick accelerations followed by quick decelerations, a quick acceleration and maybe a slower deceleration, and then perform quick decelerations alone. 
Now, if we look at the blue activity graph at the bottom of the screen, there are far more changes in speed uh, than captured at three meters per second. So if we look at changes in speed, so accelerations and decelerations at two meters per second and include high speed running distance. And this metric is usually uh, referred to maybe high metabolic load distance. We see that the player in the bottom of the screen is engaged in far more activity. So using this metric of high metabolic load distance can capture a lot more of the demanding We've just seemed to have lost Damien's sound there for a sec. So, um, Damien, if you could maybe just maybe performing similar to is rather than rather than the frequent changes in speed that are used in competitive matches, like in the graph. They are often at uh, they are often tend to be at a low constant speed. Now, everything that we looked at so far was averaged out over the full game, over the 70 minutes or over per playing half of 35 minutes. Now, if this is the case, there are some periods within the game that are far more demanding than the others. So to investigate this, we, use, uh, we looked at the maximal intensity periods or the worst case scenarios in hurling. So what is the worst minute that can happen? So the maximum running intensities during elite hurling uh, investigated the total distance, high speed running and sprint distance per minute. And these were assessed over the full game and per position. So over 22 games, the maximum one minute up to 10 minute periods were assessed using a rolling average method. So if you focus on the top of the screen for a minute, and if we remember that the total distance covered per minute was 109 meters every minute. Now this is average out over the 70 minutes. So if we look at the maximum intensity period, and this is actually 184 meters per minute on average. Now this, the meters per minute actually reduce as the, the duration increases. Now, likewise, if we go to the bottom of the screen and we look at the yellow bars, which represent the average high speed running distance per minute, we, we see that on average, hurdlers cover 12 meters per minute. And the blue lines represent the sprint distance per minute, which is eight meters per minute. And this again is average out over the 70 minutes. However, the maximal intensity period for high speed running is actually 54 meters per minute. And for sprint distance is 42 meters per minute. Now, interestingly, when we looked at these maximum intensity periods, they can occur in either half. So if our conditioning sessions are based on the mean data alone, we might be under preparing these players for these maximum intensity periods in the game. Now, the, remember that these are only one minute of activity. They only happen once in a game, but they do happen. So players need to be ready for them. So looking at the maximum intensity periods for positions, we see on top of the screen that full backs and full forwards perform the lowest maximum total distance and high speed running compared to the middle three positions. Now again, these differences in positions may be explained by the differences in the game tactical roles that the, the middle three positions have. 
on the bottom of the screen, we see that there was no positional differences in sprint distance, especially for one and two minute maximum intensity periods. Now, as the maximum intensity periods increased from three up to 10 minutes, there was small differences, but these differences range between two to five meters per minute, which were, were minimal. Now, if we go back to that same midfield player and we look at his maximum intensity period, it occurred in the fourth and fifth minute of the game. He covered, on average, 178 meters per minute. Within that, 40 meters of that was high speed running and 40 meters was sprint distance. He covered 87 meters of um, high metabolic load. But if we look at the graph on the bottom, we see that he had two accelerations and three decelerations at greater than three meters per second. Now, if we compare this midfield player to the midfielders in the study, they actually reached 194 meters per minute and 53 meters uh, high speed running and 43 meters of sprint distance. So with this data, we can design hurling activities that produce these numbers. And with a click of the button within the StatSport software, we can calculate the maximum intensity periods. And we can change the, activity, uh, the duration between one, three, and five minutes. So we can ensure that our activities in training, be it drills or small set of games, are reaching these maximum intensity periods. So now, to add to what we know so far, accelerations and decelerations are important. They happen together, and also they happen separately. We need to include maximum intensity periods scenarios. Positions, so similar maximum intensity periods uh, for sprint distance. And between halves, we need to vary the maximum intensity periods over the session because um, these worst case scenarios happen in the first half and in the second half. So let's now take a look at some practical applications. So in the top left hand corner we see in box A is a typical small set of games um, in, in hurling. Maybe in a 40 by 40 meter area, players are keeping possession of the ball. Now this usually ends up with players performing similar low speeds. Now, if we repeat this activity, well, they get used to living at this low pace. If we go down to B and we add in a goals at each end, players would now have to focus to attack and defend. So as they switch between attack and defense, they're more likely to change speed. And also they're experiencing hurling specific decisions, when to run, where to run, who to pass to. Over to C. Now, if we're focusing on one goals at each, each end, players can tend to maybe narrow their attack. So we could introduce maybe an American football type uh, end zone where players strike the ball to their teammates within the end zone. And then if we move on to D, we could include a halfway line where players attack, uh, where the attacking team must get all their players into each of their half to score. If we're thinking about sprinting and recreating opportunities for sprinting, the size of the playing area will dramatically influence the player's ability to sprint. So remember that players need to reach 6.1 meters per second for a sprint to count. So if the area is restricted, like in the example A, players will be limited by the sidelines and the end lines, and also their opponents and may find it difficult to reach their sprint speed. So if we look at B, we increase the playing area and we allow players more opportunity to perform sprint actions. Moving on to C, and we play the same uh, sort of scoring in the goals, but this time we reduce the numbers in play. So possibly after a set duration, these four players on the sideline come into play and four 
others leave. This will give more space to sprint into and get away from or chase their opponents. Now, in D, as players can strike the ball large distances, the ball might be traveling rather than the players traveling and giving the players an opportunity to sprint. So we may need to add in a rule within the game that limits the players striking the ball. So players may hand pass the ball to each other. So if we're trying to recreate the maximum intensity periods, in A, on the left-hand side of the screen, is a typical um, traditional game that's played in hurling training, where the backs and forwards start in their positions and feeders would strike the ball into the forwards and they would try and score. The backs would try to get possession and maybe uh, strike the ball out of the area. Now, the disadvantage with this game is that with the so much activity, the game loses the intensity after a couple of minutes. So there was too much activity in the same location. Now, if we flip over to B and we replicate the setup at each end of the field, we can play for a set duration feeding balls into, each, uh, into the same half. Then, after a set duration, swap to the opposite, opposite half. Now, the opposite half could be playing while the first half are resting. And this is the coach can um, increase the amount of activity by increasing the amount of balls being hit into the area and the frequency of which they're hitting. And then, in contrast, the coach can reduce the activity by reducing the amount of balls being hit in giving them more opportunity to uh, rest. So what do we know so far after this? To summarize, our notes for our training sessions. We need to perform sprints. Uh, we need to perform at least 22 sprints in training. We need to vary the length of sprints. We need to allow enough space to reach above 90% peak speeds. We need to perform different intensities of sprints. We need to think about varying the directions of sprints. We need to create repeated sprints because they're, although they're rare, they do happen in, in, in games. We need to create opportunities for acceleration and deceleration, possibly uh, linking together, but also separately. We also need to include maximum intensity periods uh, scenarios within our training sessions. For positions, we need to think about creating extra total distance, high speed running for the middle three positions. And everyone can perform sprint training together, especially when we're integrating um, the skills into the games and small city games, we need to make sure that everyone is getting their um, amount of sprints sprints to and away from goals and creating match context so players need to think about when to sprint where to sprint now we see that there's similar maximum intensity periods for sprint distance now between halves we see that there's a minimal drop off in total distance high speed running sprint distance the number of sprints the mean length of sprints the number of repeated sprint bouts. And we see that sprints occur in the middle and late in the game. So we may think about putting sprints dotted across our training session. And we think about varying the maximum intensity periods over our training session because they can happen in each half. So I'd like to thank Stat Sports for their continued support. Their cutting edge technology has allowed me to investigate these match play demands of hurling. Uh, thanks to Sean and, and Alan, but especially to Andrew Morrissey for his expertise. Great stuff. Um, cheers. Thanks a million for that, Damien. Um, really, really interesting stuff there. Very, very thorough. Um, you know, sometimes like I, I really like to the, the the use of the activity graphs and stuff. Sometimes, you know, I can 
I myself and I'm sure other people are guilty of maybe not looking at at, at something that's that's straight in front of them there. Um, and you know the sort of the spread of of there's accelerations, decelerations, sprints, and, and yet there's a lot of information contained in in that activity graph alone and those um that speed trace. So um I have uh, a few questions for you if if that's okay. Um that's okay. So so the first one here is um what would be the, the typical loading plan uh, during a, a sort of a training week for an inter-county team in the round robin phase of the championship, given that the players work regular jobs and, and how you manage that, that load to ensure uh, freshness for, for games? Okay, so over in the last maybe two to three years, this new championship structure has come, come into, into play. And it is really, really challenged because the first year that we were in, involved, we had four matches back to back. Last year, we had a break in the middle. So we had two games, a break and two games, uh, which changed our, our um, loading. Now, the different loading occur because of who plays in the game. So if, if players play in that match, uh, they may be reduced on the Tuesday or Wednesday night of training, whereas players who didn't play uh, may get extra amount uh, within those training sessions. Uh, typically, we we probably perform two training sessions over the over the week, and by that stage in the intense activity, we're trying to keep players fresh. So we're really monitoring what they're doing and limiting what they're doing. Um, so it's it is a challenge. But using um, the stats board live monitoring, uh, we can uh, help to maybe load the players and using the thresholds within that, we can see when, when the players have enough. Because we want them doing enough so that they're not spiking at each game. Uh, so it's not as if they're, they're resting in between. They are performing some activity. Um, but it's usually the Tuesday or Wednesday night after the Sunday because it does take um, 24 or 48 hours for them to be ready uh, to perform training after that. Okay, and do you see uh, a route in hurling for, for position-specific training? That, that one has came in from, from a few sort of different, different people. Um, yes, okay, so a couple of things. Um, at inter-county level, positions are more defined than at club level. So at club level, they tend to rotate around positions a lot. At yeah. inter-county, they tend to maybe, they're either in the half-back line or their full-back line, and that's it. Now, um, there is times where the full-back line or full-forward line have to come out the field, uh, but it, it might be only for a small duration of time. But again, if that's the case and those players are identified, uh, that possibly coming out into that area, well, they have to be ready for those extra demands of the middle three positions. So identifying maybe uh, position-specific activity is a little less clear than maybe in the likes of rugby, where, where it's more, more defined. Okay. Um... And then the last one is just a very quick one. Um, when you're training and for for speed exposure, um, obviously, obviously not in in the in your game based scenarios, but if you're doing extra conditioning and stuff like that, are the players wearing their equipment? So the for those of you who are, who are maybe not familiar, again, players will all carry a hurley and will will wear a helmet, uh, and that's their only protection during gameplay. Yes, and, and for that sprint training, they, they will use um, their Harleys and helmets, um, but often maybe they, they will run without it uh, to really, fo if they're focusing maybe on sprint technique, but if they're okay. practicing, if they're practicing uh, sprints, they need to be able to uh, move with, with a Harley in their hands. So getting them used to that running gait cycle with their arms as well as their legs uh, carrying a, a hurley is very, very important, and not only linear but slight curves in in their in their uh, sprints. Okay, um, well, 
we'll we'll leave it at that. So, Damien, thank you very very much for 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 logging on and and for presenting for us this afternoon. Um, and I suppose best of luck to to yourself, the rest of the Tipperary um, backroom team, and and all our other Gaelic uh, Gaelic game clients um, in the championship whenever whenever things resume.